Call the regular school committee meeting February 27th, 2017. Please rise. If Mr. Stevens, if you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance, please. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Going through the school committee members and student reports, chair report, nothing to offer right now. Resource committee. Nothing at this time. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Uh, school building needs. Nothing at this time. Policy committee. Ms. Cragen is, is uh, at a prior engagement. Um, student support committee. I don't know if you can see Ms. LaBelle Pierce is not here as well. School Personnel Committee, Executive Committee, Student Report. Um, so last Thursday, the January SAT scores became available to students, and they're able to analyze the results they got with uh, linking their College Board and Khan Academy accounts, uh, since their guidance counselors set them up for them. And this Wednesday will be the Student Advisory Council at 7 a.m. at Fitchburg High. And this week, we are working towards a attendance goal of 92%. Um, Anna? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this past Saturday at the state meet, the indoor track team, um, they did very well, especially the boys' 4x2 um, relay. They broke the school record, and they qualified for the New England meet. So nice. they move on to that mm -hmm. in two weekends, I think. Um, this Friday, we're following our advisory schedule. The freshmen are taking a survey about possible possible vocational programs that we could offer in the future and the other three grades are doing normally scheduled advisory activities um, our winter ball was rescheduled to this Saturday turning into more of a spring ball because it's March <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah <laughs> and um, throughout March the ELA and math MCAS will be taking place so Right. Not much for this week because where's the ball being held, Maria? Um, in the cafeteria. Oh, that's okay. okay. How's it going? Good. Okay. Yeah. Any tests this week or anything? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, a couple. I always ask you that. All right. Thank you. Um, approval of the minutes from the previous school committee meeting, February 6, 2017. Make a motion to approve them. Motion Second. made to approve. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed it is unanimous. No need for executive session. Communications. I go ahead. Well, because I have one one yes. quick thing, Miss Cragen. Yep. Uh, there's a vaccine and microchip clinic uh, Saturday, March 4th, 2017, at Fitchburg Central Fire Station. It's from 10 to 12. Um, it's rabies shots, five dollars. The distemper and pavo shots, and twenty dollars micro chip shot. So uh, all dogs must be on a leash, all cats must be in a car carrier. So that is this coming Saturday. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Stevens. Any questions from the committee? I have a, a comment to make regarding an observation uh, by a Mr. William McSheehy. He is a Fitchburg State Uni University supervisor for practicum students for many schools in many cities and towns that he's been doing for a number of years. And he observed at South Street School Fitchburg, grade three classroom, teacher Julie Nato, student teacher Jessica Martell, classroom consisted of 24 students, and it was a fractions lesson. And this is what Mr. McShee reported to me, and I think it's outstanding and something that we should uh, celebrate. By far one of the best lessons I've ever observed anywhere, and I've seen many wonderful schools and classrooms. 100% of the students in this room were motivated and engaged in the process of learning a new concept with incredible enthusiasm with a real sense of confidence throughout the entire lesson. There were so many aha moments I actually lost count. These kids were excited and proud of what they knew and how good they were doing as active members of the lesson. They worked as a whole class, small groups, and individually and consistently on task and confident. The lesson was extremely well prepared, beautiful teacher-made materials, and a creative flexibility in giving real-life examples of how fractions are used and why they are important. This was a pleasure to observe. That's wonderful. Thank you, everyone. 
Now we're in the public comment section. Anyone wishing to make a public comment? Yes, sir. If you'll come forward, your name and your address, please. Hi, my name is Daniel. Sit down at the table and the mics will be right. Sure. Yeah. Hi, my name is Daniel Timothy Olson, 391 Elm Street. I have a kindergarten student at Crocker Elementary, and uh, I'm making comments in regards to the uh, canine searches that were being discussed later in this. Um, totally understand the city and the school system have the right to search their property. I object to the actual, uh, uh, what would you call it, the parts of the policy that would allow dogs to sniff students and their property, particularly with like the K through five students. Um, also, I'd like to see, propose that you guys consider maybe just having this policy enacted for maybe a year and reconsidering its effectiveness. And I mean, I could go down a whole list of arguing the constitutionality or whatever, but I'm not here to do that. Just wanted to give my two cents and uh, offer a compromise. Thank you, sir. Yep. I failed to mention public comment is uh, limited to five minutes. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yes. My name is James Farrell Jr. I live at 68 Highview Street. I'm speaking out against the proposal for canine searches in schools, uh, primarily on the basis of a cost effectiveness measure and the fact that they could be multiple more effective measures of finding drugs and other contraband within schools. I'd like to know what happened to simple community policing, building relationships with school resource officers and with students and staff. Um, from what I'm aware of, there are far more pressing, pressing issues in the schools, such as uh, general security. Uh, you, don't, you don't need dogs to find weed or ecstasy in a high school or a middle school. Kids themselves rat themselves out. High school kids don't use their lockers. They keep their bags on them, they sit in class. Unless you're searching the classrooms, unless you're searching the students, you're not gonna find anything. And by introducing canine dogs and what is essentially a lockdown procedure during a search, you are by effect, or in effect, treating these students like prisoners. You're confining them to a room, you're having dogs sweep hallways, and, t and then keeping them in the rooms until the sweep is going to uh, finish. I, I fail to understand how, in a high school environment at least, this would be effective. In fact, I, I view, in my personal opinion, it would reinforce uh, later down the line, a lack of respect of authority from teenagers and other youth if they're treated like prisoners in the public school system where they're confined to a room, have their belongings searched on a periodic basis, and the fact that, well, there, there's much better, more effective ways of going about this by building relationships with the students through staff, the SROs, guidance counselors, principals, the whole line, and I think that's all I really want to say about it, is that I oppose it. It's not worth the money, it's not worth the time. K uh, Fitchburg does not have its own canine unit. Uh, as I understand, Lemonster does, State Police does. <coughs> I just failed to see the point. <coughs> Uh, I think that's all I have to say on the matter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Good evening. It's nice to see all of you. I haven't seen you in a while. My name is Dolores Thibault Munoz, and I live at 51 Longwood Ave here in Fitchburg. I want to start off with a quote um, by... Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about the things that matter. 
I speak to you today as a mother of a child at Fitchburg Public Schools. She is at McKay and she's in third grade. As an attorney, as a former city councilor elected to office, and as your constituents, constituent, I am concerned about this canine policy and I ask that this governing body not support this canine policy. It concerns me that this policy sends an alarming message to our children. I have been to visit prisons and the atmosphere of fear is purposeful and used to dehumanize those incarcerated. These tactics outlined in the policy does just that to the school environment. I don't agree that this policy is about safety. That protects our children from drugs. It's the prevention and nurturing environment that I believe this district believes in and has taken positive steps to create. This policy will set that work back. It is a fact that it, there is a resource officer in the school that is supposed to build relationships and monitor the negative behavior in the high school in particular. And furthermore, there are security cameras everywhere. So why this policy? I have serious concerns about the search procedure and what are the protections of children being searched by adults. Can you imagine my eight-year-old daughter being barked at by dogs, by dogs sniffing her and being patted down, being touched by adults? I just want you to imagine that picture of an, my eight-year-old little girl being put to that put through that because I know that according to a UC Berkeley study close to 80 percent of canine sips sniffs give false readings they also don't really detect pills and those other th concerns that you have so what is it parents are given notice but that's it I would want to be present and if possible have an attorney with me. From what I gather, not much consideration was given outside of consulting with school outside of the consulting with school administrators, staff, and police. It seems in light of that, the research that was so clearly found to be able to for you all to come to this conclusion was one sided. And that doesn't seem like there was due diligence. <clears throat> I speak to you as an attorney, and I'm not going to go through the Fourth Amendment procedures. I know the constitutionality of it. I know it's legal. I know that you can do it. I know that a lot of schools have do done it. I also know that this state in particular, and lots of states across the country, are looking at criminal reform right now. And they're looking at measures like this, and they're, and they're and they're reconsidering their effectiveness and they're reconsidering what they do to the community at large. We're working with the most vulnerable in our community, our children. So I want to just say that these laws lay the groundwork for further criminali criminalizing behavior and our youth. This is going to have a serious consequence for kids in the future. I don't, I, I these policies are, are you know, what happens if a child is incorrectly sniffed? What, what, none of the policy doesn't take these things into consideration. Doesn't consider if they're, if they're going to be prosecuted and their life is going to end at 18. The Supreme Court and the SJC have already decided the vulnerability of children who are impacted in the criminal justice system. I mean, they know that kids make mistakes. And these mistakes will last throughout their lives. You all are in charge of making these decisions that are going to have long-term effects. This is serious, and I know that you all take it seriously. Third, I speak to you as a former elected official who cares deeply about this city. I plead with you that you re reconsider your already steadfast and, and concrete um, decisions that you have come to this meeting with and really just try to listen to us all. If there's anger and passion in our voices, do not bend to the temptation to take it personally. I ask that you please open your mind, 
look at the situation from all angles and do what is best for our children. And finally, I speak to you as a constituent. You are my representatives, many I voted for. I ask you to do our work, to the people's work, and consider our point of view, the opposing point of view. And I leave you with these parting words by Benjamin Franklin. Those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else, else wishing to speak? Sir. My name is Neil Delfeld. I live in Fitchburg, and I have two daughters in, in the grade schools here. Uh, you've heard everything I've had to say, for the most part. So, I mean, I've said this num numerous times, everything I could say today. I do have one idea that might be, you know, novel, but I doubt it. Canadian policy requires dishonesty from the administrators. It requires them to search without facts of crimes. We require the police to have some suspicion, usually probable cause, that there's crimes committed. We don't just let them go do whatever they want to do. Why? We're citizens, and if you don't know that we're doing something wrong, that's what we are. So when you get to these Fourth Amendment searches, they're based on probable cause of crime. In the schools, it's a little bit different. The administrative searches are based on uh, reasonable suspicion. And these canine searches are purely hypothetical. I mean, if you ask the question, what crime are we going to find? Drugs, right? Where are they? I don't know. Who's doing it? Who has them? I don't know. No. Who do you suspect? What kind of drugs? You don't know the answers to these. There's nothing you're going on. You're bringing him in on May 3rd. So answer the question. On May 3rd, just some date, April 5th, on that date, do you know that there's going to be a crime committed? That's what the dogs are doing. They're going to search for those crimes that you don't know are committed. In general, this has never been allowed. You can't search the students. You can't search their bags. Not without reasonable suspicion. Not without some reason that you could explain to a judge or someone else. You could articulate what you're looking for, where you expect to find it, who it is that has it. These dogs are different, obviously. I mean, I think this is all that terrible. This is just something new to a Fitchburg. But the Fourth Amendment was developed on this very violation It requires us to be free from unreasonable searches. It requires, if you're going to search, you have some kind of articulable facts, specific articulable facts, that you can show to a judge if need be. And a matter of fact, it requires that you do that before you can search. It's based on the writs of assistance. I've said this numerous times, so I don't need to go into that. In 1983, the U.S. versus Place was a court case that carved a hole in the Fourth Amendment and allowed you guys to fill it with whatever you want now, you could replicate the Fourth Amendment rights. You could do that. But instead, you're going back to searching without any reason, without any cause. That's what the policy is, is, is that you're putting in place is allowing. You require your administrators to act as if people are guilty without knowledge of their guilt, without any suspicion of their guilt. It's offensive to our students' rights to privacy, to their liberty, to their rights as citizens, who have rights under the Constitution. And you may not think these exist, but you're forgetting the Ninth Amendment. Not all rights are, are, are listed out in the Constitution, but they still exist. 
Look at the innocent students. What do they see you doing? They know they're innocent. They know you have no facts. They look at you and they, uh, they think about their administration. And what do they see? They see small, fearful people who are afraid to level an accusation, afraid to pick someone out because they, they have reasonable suspicion that they're high or whatever. You look at the guilty students. They see the same thing, except they know now that they have to hide their drugs. But I don't think this really matters, because I think you want the drugs here. I think that you've spent too much time invested in this to let this go. And I think that there's too much written up that this has to go on. I think you want the dogs. But I argue that you actually don't really care about the drugs. The last time I was here, the only thing I said was that this policy gives me standing, which means standing to sue. The next time I saw the policy, you had added a clause. I'm not sure who did it. I assume it's the policy committee. Added a clause that said, well, the grades that my kids just so happen to be in, we're going to review that. We're not going to include that as part of it. As a strategy to allow me no right to sue. You don't care that there's drugs in first through fourth grade. You're going to review that policy now. But when I was at the meeting where this was decided, you did care. Matter of fact, it was argued that you had to be continuous. Your expert argued this. I mean, you remember this, right? Yes? No? You don't Sorry, remember you're at You're beyond your five minutes. Could you Do you mind if I wrap up? it up? Please. <clears throat> If you're going to deny the experts, if you're going to deny any reason that you put forth that drugs have to be found no matter what the grades, no matter what, and yet you do anything to keep drugs away from your kids, as Sally Craigan said, then what is the reason if you can remove four of those grades from consideration? Why are you bringing them? Are you actually acting? to protect us from drugs or not? Do you really believe any of this? I can't figure out why you would want to bring the canines in. You're acting, asking the administration to act dishonestly against the laws. You won't replicate the Fourth Amendment rights. If you won't act rationally, we have to take other recourses. If you insist that you're going to bring it in no matter what's said, no matter what facts are there, we have to take other courses. The data doesn't show there's an epidemic in Fitchburg, nor in Fitchburg Public Schools. The data doesn't show that you've even found kids enough to warrant bringing your dogs in. It's just not there. So why are you doing it? Are we driving to a wrap-up here, sir? That was it. That was it. Thank you. <laughs> Next. Yes. My name is Amanda Berg. I live on 105 Plymouth Street, apartment 32, Fitchburg, Massachusetts. I am a mother of two beautiful girls, and I object to canines going into schools and searching students. I object for several reasons, but as it seems from looking at the panel that this, it seems that the decision's already made, regardless of what we say, although these things will be happening to our kids. And no one seems to have addressed if something does happen where it traumatizes our kids, then what? Can you figure out some way to explain to a parent why their child could have been patted down by adults, been sniffed, been taken people, police officers, been lied to by the administration. I, I would need you to explain to me how that's gonna happen. And these same kids are asked to come to guidance counselors or people, social workers in school and speak on their personal lives and speak on all this, but you've 
pretty much killed their trust by having canines in their school, having them addressed by police officers in more than likely a stern authority way. So I, I really don't see how this is going to help at all, especially as others have said, where's the money? Where's, it's, it's, not, it's going to cost us. As others have said, it goes against a lot of, it's legal to go to do what you're doing that doesn't make it right. A lot of things are legal that aren't right. But as I said, from body language and comments, the decision is already made and we're speaking. Hopefully you hear us and are able to change your decision. This is our community. I assume that we are the people that pay you to work for our community. So I hopefully you look in the best interest of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Nice to see you all again. It's been a while. Uh, so uh, first of all, I wanted to thank Fitchbury School Committee members, Mayor Dina Talley, school administrators, taking a moment to listen to our concerns or my concerns tonight uh, regarding the proposed policy uh, uh, that everybody's been talking about here tonight. Um, I'm speaking to you uh, as a parent of a child who currently attends a Fitchbury Public School and as a parent who intends to have, at this moment, both of my children attend Fitchbury High School. Uh, because I really like the direction of the high school and, and where Jeremy has uh, brought the work uh, in the high school. Sir, could I ask you to just state your name? For oh, I'm sorry. Record? I'm sorry. For those sorry. Who, do, who don't, some I'm people sorry. know who you are, but I'm sorry. Yeah, some yeah, people yeah, don't. Sure. So. Uh, David Thibault Munoz, 51 Longwood Avenue, Fitchburg, of course. Um, I'm speaking tonight to express my opposition to the proposed canine policy for the following reasons, which I hope uh, you will consider before conducting a second reading uh, and a final vote. Um, first, uh, the idea of doing this in elementary schools or even in the mirror of idea, idea of including elementary schools is not only absurd, but completely shameful and embarrassing it should be to the city that it's being considered. Uh, my eldest child, uh, who is currently an Applewild student, uh, and my young, youngest child, uh, who still attends Fitchburg Public School, expressed on more than one occasion how their school already feels like the military, quote, or a prison, quote. Schools should be places where students want to go, where they want to and can learn. Second, regarding Fitchburg High School, there are about 1,000 students there, but only a handful of drug dealers. We already have a full-time resource officer at Fitchburg High School whose sole job it is to police the school. To police the school means monitoring and pinpointing suspicious activity, collecting intelligence, targeting suspects once there's probable cause to do so. And as uh, Mr. Farrell uh, pointed out, building relationships with each and every student in the school. My experience as an educator has been that when students trust you, uh, and this is also alluding to what um, Ms. Berg just said, uh, those who are not doing anything wrong will voluntarily give up their peers that are doing something wrong and share information with the resource officer or administrators that's helpful to an investigation of any wrongdoing. In a school, this is called an ethical school environment. In the community, it's called community policing. Second, random searches will be merely another disruption in the already busy school day, taking away from much needed important instruction time. Third, why should we treat all students like criminal suspects when there are only a handful of people doing wrong and possibly dealing drugs? Fourth, there are three primary reasons that students leave their home districts in pursuit of a diploma through the dropout prevention program and dual enrollment program that I work for. One is anxiety. I don't think that this, having this policy would help in that, in that respect in any way uh, for students who do suffer from anxiety. Two, to escape bullying by their peers. 
and three, because they felt disrespected by school staff and or administrators who treated them like they were children at best and like criminal suspects at worst. And I don't mean just the ones that are up to no good. Shouldn't you be concerned with the continued loss of school choice dollars to other districts like ours? Where I work, I'm not talking about, I, this is obviously my district, right? <laughs> Finally, the real epidemic affecting our children these days is prescription pills. Canines cannot sniff out prescription pills because they're in closed bottles, right? Shouldn't we be focused on prevention and intervention, not criminalization? I have two recommendations. Both would involve tabling the second reading and the final vote on this policy. First, when I was a school committee member and the policy committee chair not so long ago, we eliminated a, a 1971 policy uh, which addressed drug addiction and outlined procedures for getting students into drug treatment. We eliminated this policy because it was outdated and named agencies that don't exist anymore. My suggestion would be to replace this draft policy that we're discussing here with one that's similar to the one we eliminated in 2013, except updated. And second, as a former school committee member, my litmus test was always, for any policy, is this a good policy, was always to suggest a school-wide student vote at both the middle schools and the high school. Let's imagine for a moment that everyone in, the, in a school, Fitchburg High School, Memorial, FAA, uh, long show is not a criminal suspect. Let's imagine for a moment what a student-wide vote would look like before casting your vote tonight or before you're casting your vote at all. I would like to respectfully suggest that you table this proposed policy <coughs> until the students have voted on whether or not they think it's a good idea, on whether or not they feel it makes the school safer. They are, after all, your customer base the consumers of the educational system that you're offering to them. That's all. Thank you. Anyone wishing to speak? Chief Martineau. Good evening. Good evening. First of all, I'd like to start off by uh, Ernest Martineau, Chief of Police, City of Fitchburg. First of all, I'd like to start off by saying that I, I respectfully request all the opinions and comments that were made here this evening. I truly believe that's what makes our country great, uh, where people have an opportunity to express their concerns in open forums just like this. You know, we've heard a lot of things tonight regarding Fourth Amendment rights, seizure rights. Um, is it even needed? Um, let me make something very clear. The Fitchburg Police Department is committed to making our public schools a safe and healthy environment for learning. These canine searches, in my opinion, are going to be non-intrusive. They're not, students will not have contact with the dogs, and it's just another tool to ensure that our schools are safe. I think we're at a point right now where Massachusetts voters have legalized marijuana for personal use. This is in, more important more than ever now because marijuana is going to be extremely accessible to our youth, and it's still illegal for our youth. This is just one more tool to get into the schools in a non-intrusive manner. The students won't have any contact with the dogs, and the dogs are gonna be sniffing nothing more than larkers. Um, you know, we, we've made a commitment to the Fitchburg Public Schools. We commit three school resource officers. We believe in an open environment. We believe in open communication. And I think we've exhibited that through our students with our school resource officers. I strongly support this policy. Um, the only one here this evening supporting it and like I said I, I respect the opinions that were before me however I, I truly believe based with the crisis that we're in the drug crisis we're in now I, I've had conversation with the sheriff at the Worcester House of Correction and we've talked about marijuana use and where it's led in, in most of the inmates there you know how it started 95% of them it started with marijuana use we have an opportunity to try to influence our children that this is not going to be tolerated in our public schools nor is alcohol use yes we have school resource officers there that are there to monitor things but like I said this is just another tool to bring a canine into a school and search lockers I've been assured that these canines are not going to have contact with the children 
They're going to come in while the children are in their, law, in their classrooms, and it's going to be non-disruptive for the children. I, I think it's a step that we need to move forward on. Um, keep in mind, we're the last community in this area that does not do this. Um, other communities have been doing this for years. Uh, I'm not here. No one's trying to protect our constitutional rights more than I am. Um, in today's day and age, with everything that's happening, it's more important than ever to respect our Constitution and the Fourth Amendment and the right of search and seizure. This is not about holding our children captive. This is about holding our children safe and creating a learning environment that's safe to all our children. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Any further questions, comments? Chief Martino. Go ahead. The reason I, uh, I argued the way I did is because there was some statement in the last policy that um, students were going to be searched uh, with dogs if they were given reasons for suspicion that they, were, they had dogs on them or that there was reason that they should they were committed by. You're saying that the, st the students are not going to be searched by dogs. That's right. I've gone to several different the case. schools. May I? Yes, I had you. I've gone to several different schools. I've witnessed searches uh, happen at Monty Tech, at the size of school. The students are in the classrooms. They are nowhere, in, nowhere at all in contact with the dogs. The dogs that we did a demonstration here, um, just out in this hallway here, the dogs are sniffing the lockers, and the lockers only. The, the students will not be in contact with the dogs. Yeah. You, you, are, you, you hit the nail on the head. We do need reasonable suspicion. None of my police officers are going to put a hand on any child unless we have probable cause to believe that they committed a crime. I can't say that enough, that we are committed to providing safety to your children. This is just another tool to tell our students we're not going to allow alcohol or drugs in the schools. Simple as that. And, and I will assure you, these dogs will be searching lockers and lockers only. But that wasn't answering my Sir, you said that the dogs are not going to be searching. No. But the policy states that they are, if needed, going to search them with dogs. If we rise to the level of probable cause, a dog could sniff around a bag. Yes. So someone throws a bag in somebody's locker, that gives them probable cause to search the child. Excuse me? That gives them probable cause to search the child if you find something in their locker. Is that what it is? That rises to a reasonable suspicion. So what gives you probable cause to search a child with a dog? The, the, the chances of us searching a child... Not chances. I wonder what gives you probable cause. What will do it? What will do it? If there's drugs in his locker, then we will have probable cause to believe that he may have drugs. I think he's asking how would you know if, there, how would you know if there's drugs in there without a dog? Like you wouldn't. You, just, you, so. you wouldn't know if there was drugs in a locker without going through with a dog. I, I can't tell you the schools are, is, it's a drug-free zone. Right. Without a dog, a trained dog, to go through the hallways and actually make a hit on a locker. We did it out here. We, we, we hid drugs in three lockers out there, and the dogs went right to those lockers. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's a proven, uh, we've proven over and over again that these dogs can detect the odor of marijuana. And as I said earlier, with the new law changes, the availability of marijuana is a hundred times greater than it was prior, and it's going to continue to get worse. It's just like alcohol. It's probably even easier to get marijuana than alcohol. That's why I feel that strongly about getting canines into schools. I don't want to search your children. I do not want to search your children. But I want the student body to know that we have committed to their safety to keep it a drug and alcohol free zone. And, and like I said before, I, I respect everybody's opinion in here. That, that's what makes this country so good, is that we all can voice our opinions. If the school committee decides to vote the other way on it, we're going to continue doing business as we've always done. We have three school resource officers. They're committed to your children's safety, and we're going to continue having open communication with our children. That's how we're going to continue to be the community we are. I respectfully disagree, and that's what makes our country great. Now, it is part of it, but I think the part that makes us great is having the right to speak to authority Absolutely. and have them not act. We have the right to force them to stop <coughs> if you violate our rights. Absolutely. I couldn't agree with you more. And this, to me, seems a clear violation. 
Even if it's legal, a violation of our rights. And, uh, and I respect your opinion, sir. And, and like I've had several conversations with you in the past, I do respect your opinion, but I also have an obligation to make sure that our schools are safe. And this is just one step forward for you. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Thank you. I would put this before the committee. Uh, my recommendation is we table the, the vote on this this evening for none other reason than the fact that we're missing two key individuals of the committee, one being the chair of the policy committee. So it's my recommendation and my motion that we table policy item 5718 on its second reading. Do I hear a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Superintendent's report, Mr. Ravenel. Okay, uh, Kim Cochran. Uh, when when all of you hear the word librarian, <laughs> you probably have like like me. There's this image of the woman in a wonderful life <laughs> comes to pass. Uh, but actually, what people don't realize is that today's librarian looks nothing like that, and the job is nothing like it. Every time I walk through the high school and I walk through the library, there is something new happening at the Fitchburg High School um, that I've never seen before. Uh, from displays, from um, um, online reading, to um, you've all heard of maker spaces that are being developed everywhere where they do 3D printing and create things. The leaders, not just at Fitchburg High, but across the state, are the librarians. Libraries across the state are creating maker spaces where students can go. So the last time I went through the library, I said, okay, I don't want to be the only one that knows what you're doing at the high school. I want you to come and share it with the school committee and with the public. So Kim is here tonight to talk about what's happening at Fitchburg High School. Thank you. I have presents. Oh, good. Oh. <laughs> I have 3D printed um, keychain and also a bookmark that talks about how to access the e-books that we're going to talk about tonight. Thank you. Know. This is like Shark Tank where they give everybody a little <laughs> gift of, before they... I start with the presents. Yeah. Okay, I just need to bring this to... <laughs> so this is basically my life at the library. Um, I'm working with students on a regular basis and... Um, the cartoon at the bottom is, is sort of the librarian theme song. It's a cartoon that talks about um, the fact that the internet really isn't the answer to all of our questions. A cow, that's impossible. The cow is caught in a spider web, and then it says, no, it's on the web. It must be true. These are the things we deal with on an everyday basis in the library. Up in the right-hand corner, that's um, I'm working with a classroom that has come up to do some research, many of whom had never been in a situation where they had to conduct research before. So it was all brand new to them, and we start right at the basics and get started from that. I'm going to just walk through the collection, the initiatives we've taken on, and um, what we plan to do in the future, and some outreach. As fast as I can. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I can stand and do this. Yep. Can you, everybody? Yep, you? everyone can hear you. Thank you. So the first thing I did when I got to the high school last year was I had to establish what, the, what was in the collection and what needed to go and what needed to stay. Um, I have found many books that were checked out to my parents mm -hmm. and to their parents. So my grandfather would be 100 years old, uh, 115 right now, and his name is in one of the books. <laughs> <laughs> and my uncle, who's 96, his name is in one of the books. So, there were changes that needed to be made, and I have started pulling. The kids don't really want to read those archaic tomes, although I have trouble letting them go. I have to admit. So, I'm being very selective. We have some very rare and important books in that collection that I'm setting aside for Ken Gloss to come look at, and maybe we can raise some money for the district that way someday. I'll talk to Bob about that someday. Um, 
in addition to the items I've withdrawn from the collection, we've had hundreds of books donated since I've been there. The Red Raiders Lending Library came with dozens of boxes of books of fiction and some nonfiction as well that we have incorporated into our collection. And they were all much newer than what was there on the shelves already. So the students are already accessing those. We also have other donors who have seen articles about the library in the newspaper and have stepped up and said, I can see that the library is really active here and we'd like to help. Um, so they've donated all kinds of materials. In addition, we have lots of art activities in the library. For one, we did a, um, a workshop on book art. I happen to do those three in the corner there in a previous job that I had, and I brought all that to the high school, and the kids, of course, jumped right on it, and we had a nice workshop last year doing that. And on the right-hand side, you can see the new 3D printer, and that is actually a new, new 3D printer. It just came a, about a month ago to replace the original one. Um, and that has really received a lot of um, activity. The one that's in the library has sort of been designated for everyone to use, as opposed to the one in the science department, which is really for the STEM students to access. So anybody in the whole school who wants to try out the 3D printer is welcome to do so, and I can coach them, you know, help them mm -hmm. find different patterns to do or help them design their own. You can see on the bottom, there's one of those keychains that you all have. Then uh, next to those are the, the coins that we gave out last year at graduation because it was the 150th graduation. On one side it has 150 and on the other side it has the Red Raider. That took a very, 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 very long time. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it. All those students really enjoyed it. And then I made the tag beside that to go on the new um, Kindle bags that you'll hear about later. So each of the Kindles is numbered. And then the last is a basketball that I made for a teacher, but students are the ones who are really doing it. They took theirs with them. When they print them, they take them and go. So I don't have anything to show you that they did, only what I have done. But we have several students who have really stepped up and are excited about using it, and they're going to help me teach other students how to use the 3D printer. And I'm hoping that will be part of our maker space eventually. Um, since I've been there, there have been a huge increase in library activity. It's been wonderful to see. Just between September and February last year, we had 972 books go out. And this year, in that same time frame, we've had over 1,000, um, 1,075 books go out. And on the flip side of that, I've had many more come back than when came back last year, which I think of as a great thing. Um, then in the next column, information literacy classes. These are times when I work collaboratively with different teachers in the building. They bring their students up to the library, and we work on different research projects. Or as you can see, I'm trying to influence information literacy and digital fluency, sta the, uh, the standards that we have in Massachusetts. I try to impact, impart that information <coughs> to the teachers and to the students as we go along. We have an accelerated reader in the high school now, and I'm sort of the person who's coordinating that with the teachers. I keep track of all the student passwords, and I make sure everybody can access the program to take the test and run the quizzes. <coughs> um, the number of teachers who have started working with me has gone up. Let me say that. It's been just so nice. I can't say enough how welcome I have felt at the high school since I've been. Um, one of the great, exciting <coughs> libraries is, um, in Massachusetts, there's something called the Commonwealth eBook Collection, and if you have a um, Fitchburg Public Library card, you can access it through that library, but the high school students are now able to access the Commonwealth eBook Collection through the Fitchburg High School membership. We are um, one of a few high schools who are now part of it. Many more will join. Mm. But, um, that's great. We're, we're well, can you talk persons. about what that specifically gives for people who don't know what that is? Sure. The Commonwealth eBook Collection is a huge, enormous collection of um, online books that they can check out and download to the Kindles that we have purchased for them to use, or to a tablet, or to an iPhone, or mm -hmm. to now Chromebooks as well, which is brand new, and they're having some problems with that currently, but I see 
light head, the picture is light ahead. Um, on our website, I am able to um, create the wall, they call it the wall, where you can put up the featured books. And in our case, we would feature YA novels and YA nonfiction, and we would talk about um, how to access different research tools. It, on the Fitchburg Public Library, it's got an entirely different focus, of course. So in our case, they just need to, and the little pink slip that I gave you explains to you or to the student how to create your login ID. And you need that prefix, F-H-S-L-I-B, in order to make sure that you're checking out books from our, you've already done it? I just it? did it. You're so. awesome. So th that means that the books that you're checking out are coming from our account, which is fabulous. Hmm. So the students have the Kindles. We have nine Kindles for them to access with a cover to protect it in a carrying case with our logo on it. It says Fitchburg High Library. I'm very proud of those bags. <laughs> <laughs> and we have um, little tags on each one to give them a, num <coughs> a number. So, so far I've had half a dozen students using them. They've gone out and they've come back and I, you know, check in with them and they say they're really enjoying it. The e-books check themselves back in. So after your time is up, they, they go out for two weeks or three mm. weeks, I it forget what the amount is. Mm. The book, if you're not paying attention, it will check itself back in because you're supposed to be finished by then. But there is an option to renew it, and so I always warn the students to look for that mm -hmm. if they're running out of time. If nobody's waiting for that book, they can always renew it. And if someone is waiting for the book, then they can just get back in line. So this is what the next exciting thing is that we have to <coughs> Not every student knows we have this yet. We're working on it. Another great thing we're doing is um, in the outreach department, we've just started a poetry cafe um, it's going to be on the first Thursday of every month, but this month, meaning to Wednesday, it's going to be this week uh, on a Wednesday for change at 5 o'clock. And our first one was last month. We had maybe 18 students come and several teachers, and everyone read poetry, mm -hmm. their own poetry, someone else's poetry. I am not a poet. I read Robert Frost. <laughs> 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 um, but the students are just so creative and brilliant. Um, many of them came up more than once. A couple of them sang. It was just a wonderful evening, and we had um, refreshments that Megan and I provided. Um, you're all welcome to come on Wednesday. If you're interested, you don't have to read a poem. You can just sit and enjoy. We decided not to run it as a poetry slam because that's kind of competition, and um, we weren't interested in that. This is really just poetry sharing. Okay. Share your ideas, share your creativity. We had students from across the, across the grade levels, across the, the very diverse group of kids we have, and they all had a great time. So these are thing, other things we do for outreach. Um, I personally am involved in the library media specialist job alike, so I, I meet with other librarians in different, res, uh, different school districts, they meet every month. I go when I can, as often as possible. So Shrewsbury and Ag, um, it's the one that begins with an A <laughs> down there. Um, I've been traveling around to those meetings, and it's been wonderful to hear how other high schools are running their libraries and what, uh, how we can co what, collaborate to bring more um, resources to our kids. Uh, we were just selected to be part of the Word of Mouth Marketing Program, which is run by the Massachusetts Library System. We're going to learn how to market the libraries, not just public, but school and um, business libraries are taking part in that program. And the liaison from the Mass School Library Association to the Mass Reading Association, and what that has brought to Fitchburg is we have students who've recorded videos of themselves talking about how much they love to read and what it means to them to be able to read. And that video is going to play up on the screens at the Massachusetts Reading Association conference in April. Very exciting. Um, we've also worked, I've contacted all the other people in libraries in the school district, all the other uh, library staff, and we've started, you know, group emailing questions, you know, how do you do this? What's the best way to do that? How do you find supplies? Um, just trying to help each other in all the libraries in the district. That's very important to me. 
I really want to reach out to the other libraries and because I have about a thousand years of experience in libraries and I can I can really help. Um, I'm a trustee at Fitchburg Public Library, so I already knew all those guys before I came to um, Fitchburg High, and we have a really close bond. I go down there and get books for the kids at the high school all the time, and bring them back, checked out to me. Um, but we also have had a huge amount of library cards issued through the high school classes. I will sign them up at the high school, go down and get the cards and bring them back to the kids at the high school. And we've, um, Carlos Garcia's classes, several times. A lot of our second language learners have gotten library cards for the first time uh, in that way. Mm -hmm. so that's one of the things we're doing. And here's the future. <coughs> if you, I'm sure you've all been in my library. That big blank wall will not be blank much longer. Jeremy gave me permission to um, find a grant to get a mural created for that wall. And we're going to have three panels that are representing different um, facets of Fitchburg history. And the students are going to work with a professional artist, and we're going to have those three panels up on that big blank wall, and it's going to really pop. It's going to look great. Um, mm -hmm. We received a Mass Cultural Council grant. We had a, applied for 4700 and we got, I think, 1600 So now I have to scramble and find <laughs> the rest of the money in order to make this happen. But um, I'm sure. So far, everything has been fabulous for me here, so I'm sure something great will happen. Um, <coughs> we're also doing a poetry cafe in collaboration with Fitchburg State University and Fitchburg Public Library, which is going to take place on April 27th. Again, it's the same idea. Everybody's coming to share their poetry, music, but in this case, it's a three-way um, collaboration, and it's, it's exciting to us to be able to work together that way. Um, just started this week. We just started the News Literacy Project pilot. Um, it's a virtual classroom. It's a four-module program with um, three lessons, three, 12 lessons altogether, um, on how to be news literate. That is, how to evaluate this whole fake news mm -hmm. concept. It's what librarians have done since birth, basically. Um, <laughs> it's just got a new name, right? So it's, it's, it's information literacy. But this program, it'll be an online opportunity for me to reach out to kids. They will be able to access this program online as well as face-to-face -face if they choose. So I can run it as a hybrid. I can run it entirely online. I haven't figured out yet how we're going to do it. But we were chosen as a pilot. And so I'm hoping to reach out to some social studies teachers and English teachers and get that um, out there. Learning Commons, that's what my future. When I next come here, I'll be asking for help to get my Learning Commons going. We really want, see that table at the bottom with the screen at the end? That's the group study table. That's what they're going to see when they get to the colleges. That's everywhere now. They're not going to see a library like ours. They need to be able to have flexible seating. They need to have group study at, um, at resources. They need whiteboards everywhere to write on. And they need the maker space. They need that creativity there in the library. Um, our 3D printer is step one. Getting rid of the rest of the reference section over there, just to, not all of it, but part of it, um, and making that into our ma maker space. That's our next goal. And uh, P.S., I do need to work on a strategic plan for the library. Mm -hmm. Other than that, thank you. Great, thank, thank you. you. Do you have any questions? I'd love to. Thank you, Ms. Gardner. Questions? <coughs> no, well, um, is this your third year now? No, second. Second year. Um, I mean, she's just been fabulous. And uh, if you want to get enthusiastic, go up there at any time. <laughs> the library is full of kids. They're all involved doing different kinds of things. Uh, and you really work collaboratively with the teachers. You know, the teachers know that this is some place where you go to work collaboratively. So thank you very much. I really very appreciate welcome. it. Great thank work. Great work. Me. I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that, uh, the new configuration of the library you on your definitely, needs. definitely, <laughs> most definitely will. Okay. Um, so we're going to go to the uh, school presentations now. You have, again, a one-pager there that um, that is going to be used as an outline. And I'd like to call... Um, Ms. Clark to come up, and the, uh, her whole team is here from Rheingold Elementary. Good evening. 
Wow, you really do bring back up. I do. Wow. Because <laughs> it takes a team. It takes okay. a team and it takes a community. So I brought a team. So I have with me today, I have with me today Mr. Flo, who's my assistant principal. Mrs. Dollymore, our SPSA. Mrs. Flagg, who's our math coach. And Mr. Puma, who's our elementary honors coach. So we're going to talk tonight really quickly about <laughs> what we're working on at my and focusing on this year. And I'm going to start by talking about intervention. So at Rheingold, we do have a process in place for identifying and monitoring interventions for students that struggle academically, socially, emotionally, and behaviorally. So I'm going to start talking about reading. So in reading, we have four reading specialists who um, use a variety of research-based materials to help meet student needs that are struggling. Our administration meets with them every six weeks. And every six weeks, we go through every single child. We go through the data on every single child and look at those, look at that data to, ter to determine, do we stay with that intervention? Do we change the intervention? Do we add an intervention? Do, is the child near grade level or on grade level and ready to stop having that type of intervention to make a space for another child? In math, we're focusing this year, we've got a beeline focus on students that are in warning, if you will. So when they come up to fourth grade, we already have the Park MCAS score, which shows students that are in warning. Uh, for students in second and third grade, it's those students on formal and, um, and summative assessments that have shown that they're in that warning zone. So we do push in and pull out interventions in math. I, uh, inter the administration team meets every month with um, Mrs. Edmonds, who's our math specialist, to again, go over the data, go over every student, see what's happening, um, and what we need to do for those students. Uh, social and emotional. Uh, so those students that are struggling socially, emotionally, behaviorally. We have a year-long PD focus this year on meeting the social and emotional needs of students. And what I'll say about that is we're helping, student, uh, helping teachers to develop a toolkit in their classroom to meet those social and emotional and behavioral needs of their students. Ms. Jolly Moore will talk more about that year-long PD in her presentation. Um, also, we've created an RTI system, if you will, for students that are struggling socially, emotionally, or behaviorally, and it's based somewhat on some of Jessica Minahan's work, and Jessica Minahan is somebody who has been to Rheingold and is somebody that we're using in our year-long uh, PD focus. Um, so now there's a process in place. We also meet weekly with our counseling staff every Tuesday morning to go over students that are struggling, what's happening, what's, going, what's in place for them, what kind of groups are they in, what type of supports are they getting, what's happening in classroom guidance, because sometimes it affects the entire class. What are we doing for all those classes? And we also meet monthly with a student support team. And not only do, and that includes the counselors as well, but not only do we go over student needs, but we also look at our discipline data, we look at our office call data, and those types of things. So that's what we're doing as far as interventions go. And now I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Puma, who's our elementary honors coach, and he's going to talk about what we're doing to enrich students that need enrichment. Yes, as, as the elementary honors coach, and I'm going to call it EHA in the future, E-H-A, <laughs> Uh, my function is to push and challenge students who need a challenge and who would profit from it. So uh, I've got two categories that I think of what I'm doing in that context. And this applies to language arts, math, and STEM, which is science and engineering and technology and math. Okay? So there's comprehension in a global sense. A lot of times kids will be doing math curriculum all year, but they, there's the glue, the binding, the coherence that I try to push. And so a lot of the activities I do are geared in that way. Um, to get people to, to achieve and reflect their advanced skills in the context of an assessment, it's really good. That's one dimension. The other is the depth of understanding. When you come to literature, the way that you, you, you all, your educators, you're familiar with this common core. It's like graduate school push down to lower grades. That's my succinct assessment of that. 
So when you approach a book like Because of Winn-Dixie, which is pretty universal, you all know the book, a really good question to get kids to talk about is, you know, the father, at some point he says, no dogs. And then within five minutes of listening to the book, she's convinced him, yes, it fits my criteria. You should have a dog. Okay. So this ambivalence turned into growth <laughs> is a theme. And third and fourth grade kids can talk about that. And that's part of, I mean, to illustrate my function in terms of language arts classes, that's a good illustration. And then they can start to see that theme in other places in the book. So it's kind of rigorous discourse, which will hopefully help people score advanced in some sort of standardized test that has to do with levels. Okay? <laughs> it's all a blur to me, but I know I think we're heading in the right direction. <laughs> so the, the uh, sorry, I, I try to be entertaining. The kids appreciate it, and now I get feedback from middle school kids writing letters about, oh, I like Mr. Pullman. He was a riot. I, I, and then I say, well, I hope they learned something. Uh, yeah. So similarly, math and science activities kind of push opportunities for constructing coherent comprehension of the curriculum covered in the grade. So if you want a whole lot of letter C words in one sentence that makes sense, that's it. Okay? Finally, in this, I kind of like the way this fits with what Martha was saying earlier. The groups of students, we've identified another subgroup, which is a group that's been brewing. And a lot of times, this students, former ELL students, who think really well, but don't necessarily score well on standardized tests that would be tend not to get into EHA groups because we're using, you know, uh, assessment, assessment criteria <clears throat> where it really helps to do well on certain tests. So we've got a uh, initiated group, which are students that have that sort of high-level thinking potential, uh, but need more formal academic discourse language. So vocabulary and ways of talking academically. I think I've done two minutes. <laughs> 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 okay, Mr. Okay. <laughs> I'll be talking about meeting the social emotional needs of our students and maybe some teachers. <laughs> it all makes sense. Okay. At Rangel, the staff has been working together to face the needs of our students head on with a lot of understanding, compassion, and respect. Um, we started last summer. Our instructional leadership team met over the summer as a group, and um, we did a lot of um, research about. Uh, children in Poverty, studying the work of Eric Jensen, uh, who wrote the book about uh, children living in poverty. We learned more about anxiety and behavior from Jessica Minahan. Um, she wrote the book's uh, Behavior Code and the Behavior Code Companion. Um, she looks a lot at, at anxiety um, and gives insight on how and strategies on how to work with children um, in, a, in that population. Um, we continue to reference all of her books. Uh, her two books, as well as Eric Jensen's, um, from the summer. Oh, and, and Jessica <coughs> Minahan came in, and she's consulted with us, and she came in and actually talked to the staff. Um, and she's a, she's a big guru on social, emotional, mm -hmm. behavior. And um, she she gave uh, the whole staff a lot of insight on, on students that come from trauma and, and anxiety. Um, so from there, each monthly professional development session we um, has been based on improving that knowledge and skill and providing our students with emotional and behavioral supports. Um, we continue to research which strategies work best with our students who have experienced trauma. We have a lot of trauma students. Um, our staff has really embraced this knowledge um, they've, um, that they've gained so far, and they continue to use the schools within the classroom setting. Um, it, helping them gain these, school, these um, skills and continue to work on them is our um, guidance staff um, who goes into the classroom uh, weekly and they teach whole group lessons discussing the use of coping and social and behavior skills. Um, they use various materials um, such as um, uh, Michelle Garcia Winner's um, social thinking, social detective, zones of regulation, a lot of other programs. We put them all together um, so that the teachers have a variety of supports that they can use and go to. Um, we do, as Mar Martha mentioned earlier, we meet weekly with the counseling staff, um, which includes, we've got, we have guidance counselor, an adjustment counselor, a clinical interventionist, and a behavioral specialist um, that all work together. And we discuss, you know, um, how we can meet the needs, the individual needs of specific students that we want um, to target during that week. Um, 
We also they have expanded um, groups. Um, they do at lunch groups and different times, types, times during the day. We have anxiety groups. We have um, social skills groups, um, coping groups, uh, groups that help our kids um, learn how to cope so they don't get anger. We call them anger groups so they can um, reduce their, their levels of anger in a, in a, um, in a better, more manageable way. Um, we also have therapy animals that come in to visit some of our children who have been identified with significant social emotional needs and um, Fiona's my favorite, she's a great Dane. Um, <laughs> and uh, it's really great to have them come in and the kids really respond well to those, um, those visits. So as, as we can, um, we continue as a staff to work towards increasing um, our knowledge in the social emotional field um, so we can provide the most appropriate and effective strategies to help our students. <coughs> Mr. Colon. I'm Gerson Colon. I'm here to talk about student uh, school climate and culture. Um, I think one main thing that our admin team really pushes for is communication with our staff and making sure that we have um, open lines of communication. And some of the ways we accomplish that is we have uh, monthly climate committee meetings where uh, faculty and administration sit down and just talk about what's going on in the building, <coughs> what are the issues. Once again, keeping those lines of communication open and that transparency to make sure that we're all on the same page and providing those um, powerful learning experiences for all of our students, but at the same time having a a good time and creating a, a positive workplace um, to exist in. We also have bi, um, bi monthly meetings with our union representatives and with admins where we, we, we sit down and we hash out our issues. And once again, it's all about communication and it's all about conversations and really, you know, working collaboratively to problem solve any issues that we, we may have that might be a stumbling block to our school climate or our culture. Um, we use lots of strategies to recognize students and staff. We have the Roadrunner of the Month. If you take a tour through the Rheingold, and you're welcome to any time to come and, and, and take a tour, you can see our Roadrunner of the Month board where students are recognized by, by staff for their accomplishments. We have Wednesday student shout outs where staff can nominate students for, um, for accolades that Mrs. Clark reads over um, during the morning announcements. And on Friday, we have staff shout outs where students can actually do the same for, for faculty and staff, where they can acknowledge um, those teachers that go above and beyond or just really make them feel happy. Uh, we have monthly grade level morning meetings where once again creating that culture and that shared idea of beliefs where we all get together and exist as a as a whole grade and something that we've been um we've been working on is the multicultural committee where we're trying to um get more parents to come into the building um that that usually for one reason or another might not find themselves the need to, to come into the building. So we're really trying to, to target as many as, as parents and guardians as possible to get them into the building because once again, the more parental involvement, more guardianship involvement we have in our school, the, the, the better the learning and, and that can, um, the teaching and learning that can be going on, we can um, really support that, support our endeavors. Okay, I'm Joanne Flagg, the math coach. Um, our teachers at Rheingold have common planning time daily, um, but the second Tuesday we sort of commandeer from them. On the first Tuesday of the month, um, they meet with me and we have primarily data meetings to go over um, our assessments and where to go from there based on the assessments. The second Tuesday would be with the language arts coach, with similar activities. The third Tuesday, they meet with me again for professional development, which was new this year that we have an extra time for that. Um, and then the fourth would be administrative meetings with the teachers where they can talk more at the student and classroom level on data, climate, culture, social, emotional needs. Um, this year's um, third Tuesday of math professional development has moved implementation of the Eureka math curriculum forward significantly. Um, based on program training, we began with the umbrella idea of customizing lessons to meet students' needs. Um, the program is written as a whole class lesson style, and we all know that that's not what we're looking for to, in today's classroom. So the teachers are really moving forward, feeling their own need for meeting student needs and seeing the need from the students that they can work with small groups. Um, so we're working towards customizing the program in that way. Um, to facilitate that, all of our grade one teachers have visited the Crocker Elementary School to see small group 
um, work in action there. And the fourth grade is being scheduled for a visit as well, so that's a, pr a process. We have completed lesson studies with DSAC in the second and third grades this year based um, with focus on problem solving and early area learning. Um, also uh, embedded, most embedded, is my visits to the classroom uh, where I go in and work with teachers. Um, <coughs> they have goals of how they want to organize their classroom or their small groups and I help facilitate with that and give them pointers and, and we sort of co-teach and bounce off of each other so that works really well. Um, through the year, different grade levels have had different areas of focus. Kindergarten has deepened their knowledge on early numeracy through building math minds with Christina Tondefold, which is an online um, piece that I provided um, for them. And they've learned more about what their students do when they leave them. So do you know what your students are heading to? Do you know how to emphasize certain things in the curriculum? So we've done a lot of that work and they've found that very helpful. Grades one and two have developed small group work and working on visualization of story problems as a way to create much higher understanding there. And grades three and four have focused um, primarily strongly on um, students being prepared for that certain testing where they might have certain levels that they are uh, looking to meet in the reporting uh, system. So. Um, a lot of good work going on at Ryan Gold in that way. Good, thank you. Any questions or questions? I have a yes. Question. Um, I, this is to Mr. Puma. You briefly mentioned um, having some focus on um, formal ELLs or FLEPs. Could you elaborate a yeah, little bit on that? You know what? There's. Uh, I have a lot of former, well, students who received ELL, ELL mm -hmm. instruction mm -hmm. in the. Uh, I hate to use the word, in the normal EHA groups, the ones that, you know, the bread and butter, then there are, are uh, some students that have, like, shown great potential, but that um, in other ways than are reflected on their assessments. Mm -hmm. So there's some students that I would say are not quite ready for the academic rigor of the groups, the normal groups, but are with some, I, I'm starting to think of this as, it's a conduit, it's a transitional stepping stone towards that type of group. But it would, it's better to meet with a group where we're focused specifically on academic language. So the, the design of the activities is customized to that particular group. So it's kind of, you know, it's something that's been brewing in my head and then talking with Martha as we're looking at individual students, thinking, yeah, you know, that, per that there's a, a number of people that sort of fit. And it's not necessarily even um, ELLs, but generally that is the case. It's like I've had, you know, I hate to put it this way, but I've had my eye on a student. Yeah, you know, how do, and I talk to the teachers, like, how's that student doing in class? And, you know, and sometimes it's, they're not, uh, there's this secretive, you know, thinker person who verbally you wouldn't know is that out there. So that's also a good context where they're more likely to be talkative in, when they're not around their, you know, more out there linguistically students. Hmm. Is that helping? Yeah. I, so yeah. I think we're sort talking of, of gifted ELLs, right? Yeah, to some yeah. Extent. Although, you know what, I don't want to give the impression there's know, a lot of gifted ELLs that are already in the groups. I love them because, you know, I can speak right. Spanish and they can okay. correct me. So, I mean, for example. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. All. Thank you. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. This is John Lamar. You mentioned school within a classroom. Is that similar to school within a school? Like, you mentioned school within a classroom? No, the, um, the guidance counselor is going to the classroom and they do lessons. Is that, um, is that what you're thinking of? They do lessons within the classrooms um, with the teachers there to kind of do those social skill training type okay. of lessons okay. in the classroom setting so that not only they're not just teaching the students but they're working so they work with, with the, the whole class teachers. yeah oh, okay I heard school within a classroom I thought maybe you had a pull aside <coughs> in the classroom working with students no, no. they, oh. they go in and work with the whole classroom oh, okay yeah. any further questions from the committee okay well thank you thank to you. the whole team thank you for great job
Hey, Fran is here to talk to you about Memorial Middle School. Good evening. Good evening. Um, if I could, you have your one sheet, I'd like to start by talking about some of the things that are new this year for us as opposed because it's it's no secret that our SPED subgroup has been challenging over the past couple of years. So one of our big expenditures this year, and Bob knows exactly how big, <laughs> is to um, the CAST UDL professional development. And that's going on on a couple of different parallel tracks. There's the whole group instruction where they're coming, their fourth time will be this March half day. And then there's also a pilot program um, through the Mass Academy, the Focus Academy, that's going on at the same time. So um, universal design for learning, I, I guess the, the uh, analogy that made the most sense to me, she was talking about the front of the school. She's saying if all your students arrived and there was a snowstorm and Andre hadn't canceled school and the janitors had to come out to clear the steps, <clears throat> a lot of times you would think, well, let's clear the front steps so that most of the kids can get in and then the kids that need the ramp will clear that afterwards. She was saying, clear the ramp first so everybody can get in. And that's kind of the idea of UDL. Anticipate barriers to access to the curriculum, build those into your lesson plan ahead of time so that everyone gets access to the curriculum. So that's kind of what we're working on. And the, the pilot groups are doing something a little bit different. They've um, recognized certain problems and they're from different grades. And then they've set up about uh, a hypothesis. This is what we're going to do. We're going to track data, and then we're going to see what the results are. So it's going to be kind of like um, your peers have a problem with the same students that you have. This is what they're doing, and this is the results. So that there's a wide variety of things in the UDL toolkit that teachers are already using. We're hoping to get to more of a standardized process where it's tested in the field, not just in the field in general, but in the field here with our type of kids. So that's something that's very exciting. Um, we were pleasantly surprised by the number of things that we're already doing. Um, and I think that's true throughout the district. If you talk about differentiated instruction, there's stuff that people are doing. It's world-class stuff already. <coughs> but to see it in a coherent manner um, <coughs> is something that um, we're trying to get to right now. Um, I think probably the most promising aspect of it is getting teachers to recognize that you can get at the social-emotional piece of it through UDL and combine academics and SEL without sacrificing any of the academics. So one of the things that we've been working on is components of a lesson, and obviously there needs to be some sort of assessment or exit ticket in there. So one of the instructors from CAS said, well, what if you ask your kids one of your exit tickets how hard did you work today? Or what was a barrier to your learning today? That would be some information that you would get back as a teacher. That's not strictly academic, but would help you design that lesson. So whether it was a grouping, or this happened and I couldn't concentrate, or I didn't like the book, or this type of stuff, those are all information that you can use to plan again. So that's one of the things that we're very, exci we're very excited about. And it seems to be going very well. The um, evaluations of the PD have, have come back very strong. Um, some of the um, clubs that are new this year, one of them is the uh, Civil Air Patrol, which is basically like an ROTC, only involving the Air Force. So we're starting slow. We were um, fortunate that we were able to be included in the Worcester cohort, So because normally you need to have a minimum number of students to start the program, which we would not have met at the beginning. But because we're combined with them, those numbers are combined. So um, every Tuesday evening now, that gentleman, the commander, comes over here. Um, our students dress in their uniforms, and they um, go through their program, and they'll be going to a summer camp uh, in Worcester. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's gradually catching on. It's one of those things that we hope as we see kids in their uniforms, and we start like maybe at a home basketball game, they're doing a the color guard or things like that, or leaving the pledge during the um, morning announcements, that it'll grow. Um, 
there was a lot of interest. I, I think the kids were surprised at how much work there was initially because there was a lot of kids that like, yeah, I want to do it. And then when they found out what they had to do, I, you know, you see the, the videos and you see the kids flying on the helicopters and stuff like that. It's like you don't go from point A to just jumping on a Blackhawk. There's a lot of things that happen in between. Um, the other thing, uh, GSA Club, uh, Gay Street Alliance Club, that was something that the students came to me and asked if they could start. Hmm. And I said, I think that's great. Let's see if we can find you a sponsor. Uh, and they started it on Friday afternoons, and then there were a lot of kids that wanted to join but could not stay on Friday, so we moved it to Wednesday. So it's growing. Um, and I think it's something that this generation is light years ahead of when I went to school, like recognizing not only that there are differences, but how to make each other feel welcome. Um, so those are two new clubs. Um, the PLCs things, um, like Ryan Gold and like many other schools, we have um, weekly grade level meetings. And we're kind of shifting. We used to, the coaches used to take the teachers through the planning process. Now we're trying to use those as more job embedded PD and expecting the teachers to plan with their peers on their own because through um, great effort, they have a common planning period every single day. Mm -hmm. uh, and when people come, like um, Cass comes in and they say, <coughs> one of the difficulties that we have is teachers don't have the time to meet together. And I say, we have time every single day. And they look at me like, how did you, like a middle school scout, how did you manage to do that? So it took a lot, um, but it's something that we're now expecting. This is planning as opposed to like going to a copy machine and making copies or running out to Dunkin' Donuts because you have five minutes. This is professional planning. And the PLC's things are more job embedded PD. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about for entertaining questions is our school improvement study group. Last year we had a group that was kind of meeting ad hoc. I presented um, Paula with a PD program. I thought we might get a half a dozen teachers that were willing to stay. We ended up with 20, and we ended up with another six that just the day that <coughs> we chose to meet, they, they couldn't meet on that particular day. So we talk about everything from what's going on currently at the school and how would we improve it. Um, and it's action oriented. One of the things that, that came up that we've already addressed, we were talking about the reward and recognition numbers. And you see the numbers that I had there for the, for the honor roll. And we felt that we were inadequate in recognizing those kids. So if you go out into the lobby and you look on the right above the cultures, you can see the panther paws that are stapled up there. That's something we have a drawing every week. Kids that get a panther paw, they hand it in to me. Once a week, I read over the announcements, they come up, they get to pick a prize. It, it's not like um, you're not going to get tickets to the Celtics, but it's a prize. They get, <laughs> they, get, they get recognized. We also took these kids who made the honor roll, some form of the honor roll, and the special and high honors, we had a movie for them with free popcorn. Mm -hmm. And then um, the kids that made any form of honor roll, we had a um, treat for them at lunch. And the reason that I knew that it worked, there was slight... Um, separation between them, kids would come up to me, so if I make high honors, I get to have the movie next time. And you can see the numbers, the way they shifted. The other thing that's, that we keep track of, because um, we don't really do the dibbles in the weekly readings that you do in elementary school, but we keep track of that ratio between special honors and social probation. Social probation for us is a failing grade in any subject, just one. And special honors is all A's. So we had, um, 126 kids make special honors and 85 in social probation. So that ratio is something that tends to play itself out in MCAS and in, in uh, categories that they um, kind of, you know, relate to. And typically the, the first semester is easier because there's a lot of review, there's a lot of assessment, and those numbers tend to get knocked down as you go along. And they've stayed at that same ratio. And we actually have more kids on special honors second term then uh, first and the other thing is when the progress reports came out, there were a lot of kids who were in that failing category, but by the time report cards came out, they had boosted themselves up. So I think, you know, we're heading in the right direction. Um, as you all know, middle school is all about culture. So what we're trying to do is build that culture where the right thing to do is the thing to do, uh, both academically and behaviorally. Um, the other thing is when you look at all the kids who um, made honor roll and the kids that are on social probation, that still leaves about 280 kids in the middle that we're trying to influence to get moving positive. So um, 
we thought of another area that we would reward and incentivize, and that would be attendance. And we found out that as of 100 days, we had 44 students who had no tardies, no absences. Right. So we're going to do something for them as well. So that the kids were saying, you know, I might not ever make special honors, but I can come here every day, I can get here on time, and I'm going to get recognized for that as well. So we're constantly looking at ways to kind of um, build those positive habits, recognize them, uh, and get kids to strive for them so that that's the normal thing to do. Good summary. Questions? Yeah. <laughs> Questions? Comment? Yes. Uh, yesterday, Fran, I had uh, lunch with a very good friend of mine, uh, a young woman by Tara Sweeney. Okay. Now, Tara graduated Fitchburg High School, and she's worked with the high school and so forth. And uh, Tara, uh, I guess she's kind of on the road to be an astronaut. I mean, she's in that pool, yeah. and um, she's a pilot. Uh, you know, it might be somebody. She, I mean, she's willing to come in and speak. She Absolutely. would speak to, uh, and I could get you her, her number. Uh, and because um, she's been, she's on some project with it's a 747 where it's all pressurized, where they, it's like being an astronaut, uh, uh, pressurized cabin, and they go up, and it's like weightlessness. And uh, yeah, perfect. She's uh, she's looking to take that one of those trips to outer space. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, <laughs> she's in Fitchburg frequently. Oh, okay. And um, I'm sure she would be willing to come and talk to your kids. You Absolutely. Know, that would and, be uh, that Just would give be them great. a little more. Uh, one of the things that, we're, that we haven't completed yet, we're also working with Jeremy at the high school for a yep. mentorship program yep. where we're going to have kids from the high school come down and work with some of our kids and hopefully get them community service hours. So the start and dismissal times are close enough that that may might work for us, so that's kind of in the works, and this would would certainly. Fall she would right she would be. That. We talked. I talked with her about mentorship, yeah. uh, with some. I think it's something you've talked about with uh, mentors from former graduates and what they're doing. Yeah. And uh, she would be willing to be a mentor. Uh, oh, that would be awesome. Know, yes. I, um, I'll be in touch. Okay. Yeah. Great. <laughs> Awesome. Thank, you. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. And Craig Shelton and Jen. Jen's not here about the Washington trip. Oh, uh, you know, I mean, <laughs> what's that like? <laughs> I, it's like you're <laughs> here. It must be the Washington trip. <laughs> yeah, next month. Yeah, next month. Phil Sweeney's watching. Good evening, everyone. It's always nice to be here batting yeah. cleanup on a. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like your metaphor. <laughs> so just a, a quick summary of, of the work that we've been doing at Longjo. Um, you know, we were identified, and this turn the clock back a little bit to the end of last year, we were identified as one of the schools statewide with high suspension rates, and that was a serious concern for us as well as our school community. So we started meeting at the end of last year to really look at and discuss um, what we consider to be some of the issues with that, with our suspension rates, and then how to solve those problems, obviously. So we identified three main areas to be a focus for this year, building community, and that includes both our adult community as well as our uh, student population, improving school-wide communication, and, and then bringing back some fun to middle school, which is, which is always an important thing. So our theory of action basically was if we can create and sustain a, a strong and positive culture, uh, that students are, are greater engaged in their academics, uh, more engaged in the school community, and then that will allow us to, to lower our suspension rates. So looking at the first semester this year's data compared to last year's data, um, I'm proud to say that you know, we have reduced over 60% in both our in-school suspensions as well as our out-of-school suspensions. Um, and part of this really is a reflection of greater understanding by us as an administrative team, we are sticklers for documentation. Um, everything that takes place with us and between students and between adults gets logged into our X2 system, whether it be a journal or a disciplinary referral. And, and just working with the state, we did find that we were over-documenting in some instances where students were spending a short period of time in an in-school suspension room for a break um, and not even being in there for more than a half a day, but we were recording that. So part of it was a learning process for us. 
which Jen was instrumental then in passing on a lot of that information with our uh, professional staff at the beginning of this year and really taking a look at, at our discipline numbers from last year and, and how to improve that for this year. Um, so in, in terms of building community, this is the third straight year that we, we kicked off the year. Uh, going off-site with our entire adult staff. That includes paraprofessionals, clerks, and all of our teachers. Um, and we had it professionally facilitated by a group. We were outside. It was a beautiful day, knock on wood. We're three years running, three perfect days. Um, but the focus for that was team-building activities around communication and around looking at our own biases, potentially, of why we might be looking at discipline or looking at behaviors in a, a certain light. So we thought that was a very effective um, day. It really helps unify the staff and build that positive energy, which is so critical. Um, the other pieces to that, much like Martha was stating, you know, the work that we've looked at through book studies with Eric Jensen and understanding our students, um, the, the effects of poverty, how to engage students of poverty, and this kind of piggybacks on work that we've done from several years ago um, with the Ruby Payne work around understanding the framework of poverty. And secondly, really looking at the Jessica Minahan work in understanding behaviors and understanding ways to look at behaviors differently. And I think that was probably a critical piece for us as in understanding how to manage our classrooms, but really taking a look at understanding why students were doing what they were doing and what proactively can we do to address that? Um, so that really gave us a, a, you know, some solid work at the first few early release days. It was really focused on those two book studies. Jen is now facilitating an additional book study where I think you have 20, 22. 20, 22 participants in the Jessica Minahan work. So as Martha um, talked about, you know, the identification of anxiety and some of the stressors that children um, dealing with and how that may manifest in behaviors within the classroom. Um, and they're really looking at, you know, our coaches are instrumental at working with it. We've got, you know, in the last two years, we've had 12 new teachers. Um, so my two instructional coaches are pivotal in, in being in those classrooms and doing their coaching cycles and helping them understand kind of the complexities of not just the instructional piece, in the academics, but also the management piece and the engagement piece, and they're so intertwined. So they've really been a great piece for us to leverage. Um, looking at the, the school-wide communication, you know, we looked at this quite seriously at the end of last year. We met this summer, particularly with our guidance staff. So we've reassigned our entire guidance staff. Each one of them now have their own grade level. They will move with that grade as they move from fifth grade to sixth grade to seventh to eighth grade. So we'll have a really nice, um, kind of a historical perspective on where students were um, and how we can help support them over the course of their time with us. We also provided some satellite offices for uh, guidance staff to move up into the floors. So students, they're more readily available for students um, and they're more readily available for staff um, because as you, I'm sure you can appreciate, you know, with the amount of information that we accumulate about a particular child and things that are happening in their life that may be impacting how they're actually performing in, in their classes academically and behaviorally. This is a huge connection. So we think that that piece has really helped us um, tie together some of that information. So as a student comes in, something's going on, we communicate that to the teachers. They can address that you know, proactively address it in their classroom before something even happens. Um, we also continue to look at this piece under the entire RTI model, the umbrella of the pyramid, where you have your reds and your yellows and your greens, um, and then trying to understand because behaviors happen for a number of reasons. And if we can understand why they're happening, then we can address them in a proactive way. You know, the, the, your green students are students that are able to manage themselves and self-assess and self-monitor, you know, can be treated and, and provided with interventions differently than somebody in the yellow category and somebody in the red category. Last year, we experimented with the Ames Web behavioral piece, which helped students kind of self-assess where they perceive themselves to be. And we also had assessments for the teachers. And, you know, we use that and 44% of our students at the end of last year um, assess themselves to be a high risk at engaging in behaviors that would be a disruption in class. 
Um, so in, in most cases, we were able to cross-reference that with our discipline data and also through guidance and through feedback from our teachers. That doesn't always manifest itself in poor behavior. Sometimes these are the students who just are not performing well because of other stresses that are happening in their lives. They, they become removed. They become disengaged with their peer group. So there's lots of pieces to that that we're trying to really analyze and look at under this umbrella of, of RTI. Um, Jen is also working, she's rewriting, she's got a PLC um, in rewriting the discipline handbook, looking at our own institutional biases, what may have triggered an automatic suspension, and is that really, does that make sense? Um, are there alternative ways to address some of these behaviors? And um, that's, that's been a critical piece. Professional learning community. I should have, you should have asked that, earlier. Right? <laughs> they said it like six times already. <laughs> yeah. us. And an interesting we'll activity <laughs> Jen actually went through with our staff was just showing them how data within the school is transferred to the state in real time now. It's SIF compliant and how they're characterizing um, something that transpired in their class and how that's being documented and, and what those steps are. So that was really, a lot of teachers were like, I didn't really understand that. So that was, I think, really an important piece for folks to, to look at that and go, well, that really wasn't what I saw, but that's how I thought the mechanism wanted me to report Because there was nothing to pick from on the X2, so they just went with something that kind of looked close but then when you read the write-up it didn't match at all and I was finding as we were doing our discipline reports I was getting all these error reports and then I'd go back and look at them again and, and really go through them with a fine-tooth comb and, and I caught most of that but in, in teaching the staff on how to use the system better and more efficiently it, it's helped kind of I, I don't have to catch as many so I usually go through it every two weeks every week kind of scan it to make sure that we're on track Yep. And I think th this kind of the checking of ourselves and our own self-biases and, and our own institutional biases, mm -hmm. you know, really, and again, I think the critical piece is looking at <coughs> children, looking at behaviors and understanding what this big picture is. So I think as far as communicating that school-wide has been a, been a big part of us lowering our suspension rates and engaging students in interventions that would be appropriate at their level. So guidance counselors are working with children one-on-one -on -one in small groups. We have a peer mediation group now that, that are handling a lot of you know, your middle school drama stuff that can, can bubble up and turn into much bigger incidences. Um, <coughs> and then looking at responsive classroom, looking at using CPR, looking at engaging students in the cares and understanding what assertion is, what's cooperation. Circle of power respect. <laughs> Not CPR. <laughs> but, but, also, but also understanding. Like, why didn't I know that? I'm, I'm kidding. <laughs> We're going to give you a whole. We'll give you the, the notebook. Okay. Um, but understanding that it's even under dictionary. the responsive classroom umbrella, you know, that is a tier one <clears throat> structure. So your students who fall into that tier two, into that yellow, and into that red, that is not enough support to provide them to be successful at the place where they are at that particular time. And we know that middle school can be up and down from one week to the next, one month to the, re to the next. But again, I think that, you know, the work that the teachers are doing, communicating with the guidance and guidance back to us in working with this has been giving us a whole different light to, to really understand. And then bringing back the fun is in, you know, doing more school-wide activities we've done volleyball with you know teachers against the kids and the kids against the kids we do our faculty basketball games we've had a school-wide dance we had over 200 mm -hmm. students attend which was you know just a phenomenal turnout we'll do another jen's got her spring fling coming up april 8th in in april um, <laughs> but tying all this together you know if students are connected to the community that they're in they're going to be they're going to feel better about themselves they're going to feel better about the work that they're doing and they're going to be more successful academically so that's kind of a a theory of action and as I said you know discipline data is just one piece of it um, but that's a critical piece for us We're, we are working with the state we meet again next month there is a, a whole cohort um, in our initial meeting speaking with some of our peers from across the state um, you know they were kind of scratching their head and saying well how have you been able to reduce your suspension rates by 60 or 70 percent what do you what is it that you're doing so I think a lot of it really is just professional development for us as adults and understanding children 
in a different way in children and the behaviors. We still suspend. We still have incidences that necessitate that, um, but we also try to do things much more proactively and try to head some things off. You have kids who fall into the kind of that social emotional piece that there is potentially significant mental health issues in, in using wraparound services. We, we partner with a number of agencies. We have eight outside counselors that come to us and work with our children. We have youth mobile crisis that works to help support children who are, you know, are feeling um, really depressed or anxiety and, and our guidance are critical in that piece as well. So it's, it is a, a bigger community piece. So there seems to be a reoccurring theme. This is probably a question for the superintendent, but the social emotional needs of students comes up all the time. Across the state, across the it's country. Everywhere. It's right, everywhere, right, right. No, I, I'm sure it is. I just Every educational periodical you pick yeah. up, yeah. every conference you go to, it's everywhere. Right. And, you, no. and, yeah, and you think in terms of the supports that the community in the, the in, you know, Getting a child in for, you know, in, in an extreme case, a psychiatric evaluation can take months and months and months and months. You know, so the availability of kind of on-the-go on the intervention and support is really, I mean, the, the system is overwhelmed. Um, so, you know, we do a lot of that groundwork, you know, because every day 555 bright, smiling faces are going to come to us, and it's our responsibility to set them in the best possible scenario to be successful. Yeah. Um, can can you just you mentioned um, some of the you said some something about some of the common stressors? Mm -hmm. Can you just elaborate on on that? And then yeah. are those common to just Longshore, or is that pretty much across the board again? And are, are those particular to Fitchburg? Or are there some that are particular to Fitchburg? I, I think some of them are very common. I mean, stressors in, in other community, communities might look very different. Um, being 12, I think, is a stressor. True. I think mm -hmm. if we could all <laughs> pick an age to go back to, none of us would pick 12 or 13. <laughs> so just, the, the you know, being in middle school, yeah. peer groups, yeah. how do I fit in, how do I don't fit in, right. you know, is, is a stressor. Academics is definitely a stressor. Um, and there are environmental stressors, you know, if, again, the Ruby Payne work and, and the um, Eric Jensen, mm -hmm. you know, there are some considerable outside of school stressors that then manifest themselves in what we're seeing in school. Um, and poverty does play a, a big role in that, you know, yeah. how the kids come to school prepared, yeah. we're not prepared, yeah. you know. Our kids love vacations. Vacation is, is a huge stressor for them. Yeah, huge. Because they, they, in many cases, lose that structure. School is the structure. Not sure if yeah. it's going to be, yeah. and, you know, they hate to admit it coming back, but, you know, yeah. they'd love to come back to that. Lots you know. of smiling faces today. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah, they were happy to be back. At least the two of us. Oh, I was happy. <laughs> I was happy to see you. Yeah, I was happy hearing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Craig, uh, Mr. Thompson uh, talked about not having enough uh, yeah, yeah, help, sure outside not, help I'm agencies sure for uh, kids that needed counseling. Do you have, he had a waiting list? Do you yeah, you know what, it, it, it waffles. Um, yeah. We lost two agencies, I think yeah. it was last year in the community, which, you know, they take counselors with them. Um, we've had several counselors coming that we, we have been able to kind of turn that process around very quickly and get them into counseling, so it, it kind of goes back and forth. Insurance plays a critical role. It depends on the type of insurance a family has. Mm -hmm. You know, if there's a pediatrician involved, they can help kind of facilitate the process as well. Um, but we've been pretty successful, but there have been times yeah. where, you know, from start to finish, it's been months and months, months. and months and months. Yeah. So you do have like a waiting list that <clears throat> kids that? We always have one, yeah. but yeah. typically always, have yeah. a waiting list. Yeah. yeah. And a lot of that is partnering with families, too, yeah. because there is, you know, there can be that stigma. Um, and, you know, a lot of times having that work done in school is not always the best place to have it done, um, particularly if you're talking trauma, you know, and then you go back to math class. Um, so it can be a difficult management, but it's a critical piece to it. Okay. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Nice job. Thank, Thank you. Yeah. You did a good job in cleaning up. <laughs> Thanks. Jen, quick, how's, how's the trip going? It's coming along nicely. We've got all the payments in. We're trying to wrap everything up. So. What, how, what, how many years now? Uh, 24. <laughs> 23. Can, so you'll, you'll be Getting leaving to go to your travel agency yeah. after yeah. this, right? Yeah. Yeah.
Yes. Unbelievable. Yes. Wow. Yeah, actually, yeah. I'm very good. Like <coughs> Andrew just said the um, African American museums opened up at uh, the Smithsonian, so we're going to get Really hard to yeah. get into. It's yeah. really? spectacular. We have yeah. tickets, so oh. yeah. Wow. Our tour company is yes. fabulous. I mean, yeah. he takes yeah. really good care of me. Well, because of yeah. Pete and, yeah. and Rich Pastor. When is that? May? Uh, when do you guys go? When do you go? We go in June, the first oh, week of June. Okay. Yeah. 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 After okay. all the testing is done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, that's it for our. All right, part. thank you, Superintendent. I, I only see one member of the public. Are you requiring testimony tonight? <laughs> thank you very much. All right, moving on. I think we already took a vote on uh, 17 817, 16 and 17, no. correct? Any, any discussion on that? that we 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 tabled it. It's going. We'll table it. We'll we'll bring it up at the next yeah, committee I, meeting, because, right? Because yeah, I weren't. Yeah, there were a lot of opinion tonight. And, right. Uh, yes. Yeah. Misinformation. Maybe we need to do a better job of communicating it. Well, I think I think the committee chair, uh, you know, her being a, at another commitment, it's important yeah. to have have that individual here. So uh, right. yeah. that's what we'll have that uh, prepared next time. So we got 17-18, number 16 and 7, approve the superintendent's recommendation to accept warrant WG17034. Pay the bills. Second. Motion made and seconded. All in favor? Aye. All opposed? It's unanimous. No need for executive session. Do I have a motion to adjourn? Second. Motion made to adjourn. Do I hear a second? Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. We are adjourned.